Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Month the Smart Book Reviews. Y'all like that? Hi, my name is Candace and I'm your host. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode. I'm going to try not to bull into space today. Um, however, in today's video, I'm going to be so super hyped. You have no idea. Okay. I haven't... It, I've been finished with the book for a couple days, like a week maybe, and I've meant to record sooner, but I didn't because I didn't, <laughs> because I didn't. Um, but also ignore how terrible my nails look. I didn't think to paint them until just now. Um, so I finished the book about a week ago and uh, I'm not going to forget anything. I mean, little details will probably be lost on me because I'm a loser like that, but the main plot points of the story, hopefully I will recall because, um, I was obsessed with this book. Okay, like, okay, backstory. I was bequeathed a copy of this book. A signed hardcover that was mailed to me by a Miss Gina Showalter herself uh, because I made a ridiculous TikTok video when I couldn't get my hands on an, an ARC copy of this book. <laughs> and so I went to TikTok and I was like, this will be funny. I'll just put this up. It, it'll be funny. And then her social media manager slash secretary slash stalker. Um, Naomi saw it and was like, oh my god, this is hilarious. I'm laughing so hard. We're gonna send you a copy of this because you did this video. And I was like, if I had known, I, I would have made, literally, if I had known that that's what it would take, <laughs> your girl will have signed up for TikTok like five years ago. I'm just saying. Was TikTok around five years ago? I don't know. Anyway, um, in case you haven't guessed, in today's video, we will be reviewing this guy. Don't get the glare from my ring light. This guy. Look how just, I'm sorry, okay, my, my lips are, look, can you just, can we just, can we just like, can we just, with this, take a moment. To appreciate this um oh and and these and these two these are <laughs> those are nice those are nice too boy um so yeah in today's video <laughs> creepo moment past in today's video we will be reviewing heartless by gina showalter this book was released i think the t june 29th something like that it was on a Tuesday. I forget which Tuesday. If it was the 21st or the 29th. I can't remember. But it was recently released. Everyone who's anyone should fucking read this book. I'm just saying. Uh, yeah. So this is the book that we will be reviewing today. This is the first book in a new series called the Immortal, Immortal Enemy series, I think it is. The Immortal Enemy series. Um... This is a uh, new type genre type book for Miss um, Gina. Uh, I know she said that she was going for more of a fantasy element than a paranormal romance element with this book or with this new series. Um, and I think she mentioned like her publisher wanted her to go more like they assumed it was a paranormal romance and she wanted it to have more elements of like fantasy like fantasy cover and fant you know what I mean like those like um like Jennifer L. Armentrout's Blood Nash series if you're familiar with those like they have very fantastical looking with the crown and the sword and the artsy type whatever um covers right so this is Gina's first foray into the realm of fantasy as it pertains to things outside of your typical, I guess like a vampire werewolf novel type situation. Um, this book introduces the realm of the Fae, 
which if you don't know is like fancy word for fairy, I think. Like, they're not like pixies. They're not like fairies as you would think like Tinkerbell type fairy. Was Tinkerbell a fairy or a pixie? Anyway, I can't remember. Um, they're full grown people, obviously, because who wants to watch two pixies have sex? I mean, and when I say watch, because when, when the sex scenes are home, not, you picture it in your head, don't you? I mean, I, <laughs> I know I do. Uh, and so, yeah. So this book is the first foray for her into the realm of like fantasy-ish type stuff. So the details of the book, which I, I promise you, I'm going to actually get to at some point. Uh, this book, mass market, allegedly, because Amazon, allegedly, I've say allegedly now before I say anything in regards to Amazon, allegedly has 416 pages. I think the page count for the Kindle version was like 333, which sounds very, like there's a big discrepancy there, like a big difference. I don't know if that's accurate because we know Amazon be fucking with me. So the hardcover edition, which has like a little excerpt of the Warlord at the end, which if you haven't read the Warlord, why? Seriously. Uh, has This hardcover has 379 pages. So I would imagine a Kindle, which is not much bigger than a mass market paperback or along the same lines, would have a similar, uh, would have to have a similar page count, like full 400 and change, because if this is 379, and like, look how big these fucking pages are. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Um, so you can currently get this book for your Kindle or Nook for the price of $7.99. You can get the mass market mass market paperback for seven dollars and 48 cents the paperback the physical i'll hand you this physical book not this one specifically because this is hardcover but i will hand you a physical book for 50 almost 50 cents less than the digital download i've talked about this before I think I might do more research on this because it just peeves me so badly. Why? Why is it cheaper to produce a physical product than it is to make 5 billion copies of the same PDF or Mobi file or whatever, whatever, right? You know what I'm saying? Like that doesn't... Something's not right here. Um, you can get this hardcover on Amazon for $25.49. You can probably find it, uh, maybe find it cheaper somewhere else. I don't know. Or I would highly doubt Barnes & Nobles is going to be cheaper than Amazon. Or like Books A Million or someplace like that. Like an actual bookstore. Um, but yeah. So this does come in audio format. I have not listened to the audio. However... I have heard from numerous sources that the male narrator for this book is going to make your panties wet. Like, apparently his voice is so hot and so sexy that like women can't handle it. So they go to, they've gone to the internet and they've just talked, they've just put it out there. Like, this guy was <laughs> doing my uh, So, I think I will probably at some point do, like, a reread, but, like, a reread with, like, my AirPods in, like, a re, like, a listen to. Because uh, I need to know, I need to experience that and see what that's like to have that in my life. So, um, it does come in audio format. You can get it through probably the highest tier of Audible because hmm, that's another thing that just be peeving me. But uh, yeah, so I don't have the audiobook price in front of me. I never do. Um, if that's something you're interested in, then you should probably go to Amazon and check that out because unfortunately Candace didn't bring it with her today. <laughs> so um, I will read you guys the blurb for this book and then we'll break it down because we're already three, 13 minutes in and I'm like, I'm Jones in real bad to talk about this book. <laughs> so, um, I'll read you guys the blurb, but then let's, we'll dive into it because 
I know you're excited. So the blurb for this has one of those like cute little taglines that like in bold where it's like, da, 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 da. okay, so this one says vengeance is irresistible. Da, da, da. Okay. Kesar. Okay. I, I pronounced his name Kesar. In a live chat with Gina, I heard somebody, I don't know if it was her or if it was J.R. Ward because she was also there or J.R. Ward's assistant. Somebody said his name, pronounced it as Kaiser like, like the role. And I was like, no, I can't. What? No, he can't be named after a piece of bread. <laughs> that was, I had like, a, I had like a brain hiccup and I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> K, I pronounce his name Kesar. Kesar, Kesar, I don't know, whichever you prefer. I don't know. It's spelled K-A-Y-S-A-R. Okay. So whichever you want. Uh, Kesar the Unhinged One, Fay King of Midnight, can drive anyone to madness with his song. A ruthless warrior forged in hate, he lives to force his enemies to their knees. He will stop at nothing to succeed, even abducting and seducing his foe's beloved bride to ensure his own child one day sits on the male's throne. Except his prize escapes to the mortal realm before the first kiss, her heart transplanted into a human beauty with dangerous secrets. I'm trying to think, did Cookie have dangerous secrets? I know. I can't remember. <laughs> I can't think of any, okay, well, we're gonna talk about it anyway. Chantel Cookie Bardot, and I pronounce her name Bardot because I don't know if that's, if it's supposed to be Bardot, I'm not going to do that. Uh, is a professional gamer girl great at trash talking, bad at peopling. After a long-awaited surgery, she begins to morph into a powerful fae princess. Catapulted into a strange land ruled by a cruel but seductive villain, she must battle flesh and blood monsters and navigate royal intrigues. But the true danger is Kesar whose every wicked touch tempts her beyond reason. Should she run or descend into the darkness with him? Okay, first things first. We all love like a good anti-hero, right? Like, I know I'm here for it. Like, I want my, okay. I want my, my dude to be one step short of like, cruel. You know what I mean? Like that, like you're, he's like so spicy and so like ruthless and so like he we he's so bad that he's good you know what i'm saying i know you know what i'm saying um kesar is as a character so hot and badass and yet every time you picture him in your head you will picture like you, he, you, you see, you can see him doing these terrible things, but at the same time, he's so vulnerable and like a little child, mentally, obviously, because bodily he's like, I don't know. Um, but he's just so damaged. And you know what, to be honest, his character reminded me in the, in the beginning of the book, reminded me a little bit of Lafayre from Cressley's IAD series. Um, I I love Lefaire's book. Like, <laughs> Lefaire is like a, a, he's like a madman. He's mad, he's quite insane. But he's also so intelligent that he's thinking like a hundred steps ahead at all times. And obviously like, um, uh, Kesar doesn't have the, like the, the four, foreshadowing or the forethought or what it what is that thing and where you see the future and you can see but he's he's very diabolical he's very scheming he's very like and that reminded me of Lothair and he's also kind of a little bit insane which lined up with Lothair as well um so instead of me gushing about the man character <laughs> let's talk let's talk about the female character okay I fucking loved Cookie as a character She's also very um, like vulnerable in at times, but she is very, she's very feisty. She's very badass. Take no prisoners. 
very um, confident, bordering on cocky. Like, if you can imagine like a dude who's like so confident that it comes across as being like really cocky, that's, that's Cookie's personality. But like in her mind, she's like needy and you know, lovable and like all of these things, right? Like that's, that's her insides are mushy and her outside is like covered in thorns. <laughs> uh, and the same goes for Kesar basically, except for his brain is a little bit mushy <laughs> and his outside is covered in thorns. <laughs> Did that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I think you know what I mean. Okay. So the book opens with, um, I think, Kesar. I, I think. Let me just tell you about this before I embarrass myself. Let me see. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, yeah. So the book opens on Kesar as a young child. Uh, he and his younger sister, Viore, are... Um, basically like lost in the woods. They're traversing through the woods, going from town to town. Um, they're orphans, basically. So what had happened was, Kesar's parents came down with plague and in an attempt to cure them, Viore used her, um, I pronounce it as glam glamera, glamera. Uh, it's like a phase inane ability in addition to what all they have. It's uh, like the uh, immortality, super speed, that kind of thing. You also have a little something extra. Um, Viore's, uh, Viore and Kesar's like glamera revolves around their voice. They can compel people to do what they want them to do. But the inflection you put into your demand or your suggestion or whatever you want to call it uh the inflection and the emotion that is behind it directly affects how it plays out so uh viore attempted to use her glamera to tell her parents to feel better and they did or as Gina says they did after they had died so like it, it kind of her her emotions were all over the place and not in the right place that they should have been to make it so her power could induce them to heal themselves from the plague right um they can also and i don't know if this is just kesar and not viori but kesar at least has the ability to sing uh to heal people or to kill people depending on the tone uh, the, again the tone and the emotion behind it right so his song can be deadly or it can like heal injuries or make someone feel better right uh so the book opens with them you know orphaned traipsing through the woods their clothes are in tatters there's they have nothing he's protecting her um and they come across this uh, it's like an altercation where it appears that there are three grown or adult men uh, who, or like maybe one is like a teenager-ish age, the other two are grown. Um, and they've taken a girl out into the woods, like a young woman, and they uh, essentially like ruthlessly kill her while laughing about it. And Kesar witnesses this and he feels really bad for the woman. He wants to intercede, but he doesn't want to leave Viore. Um, so in, during this time, he, they essentially get caught. And Viore doesn't get caught because he stashed her off to the side somewhere. Uh, but Kesar does get caught. He gets basically abducted or kidnapped and taken by these guys to the winter court. So in, um, what the fuck is this? Asteria. <laughs> I was like, Rrr. in Asteria, which is the realm of the Fae, there are different courts, which are just like sub kingdoms. Uh, each one revolves around like a season. So there is the winter court, the summer court, the, um, I can't remember if, if it's like autumn court and spring court. I'm pretty sure it is, but I, it, they're right. 
And the three men who had killed the girl and have now taken Kesar prisoner are royals from the Winter Court. They're known as the Frost Lines. There is the king, Hador, Hadar, and his brother, Lark, his brother, Lark, and his son, Jareth, which I, I actually... <laughs> I really like that because I was like, ooh, like from the labyrinth. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he gets taken. He can't go back for Viore. Viore is lost. She, he doesn't know what happens to her after that. Um, he's kept prisoner for about a year, at, during which time he's uh, abused, tortured, sexually assaulted by the king and his brother. Not by Jareth. But um, he still remembers Jareth's coldness and cruel, like cruel laughing while the, the girl was getting killed. So he, he lumps them all in together, even though Jareth doesn't personally like, you know, like um, molest him during the 12 months, right? So he finally breaks free and he runs away, basically. He, he escapes. He he flitters what they call like um teleportation like flittering um he grows up and he basically uh, hones his revenge to the point where he creates his own kingdom uh in an area that was previously uninhabitable uh covered with like the realm's vilest of of creatures and he just plops down in the middle of it and creates his own kingdom, which he has dubbed the Midnight Court. The Midnight Court uh, and the adjacent uh, Dusklands are like uh, Baron. Uh, the, the Midnight Court is, is, is one thing, but the, the Dusklands are like uh, Baron, the sandy clay type. It's like a desert, right? So, um, Kesar in his attempt to get revenge against the frost lines he has been slowly tormenting them for eons like he's super old now and you know like immortality speaking uh and he's been repeatedly like he he finds them he tortures them he lets them go he finds them he when he escapes he does so and kills the king's brother, Lark. He realizes at that time that uh, death was too good for him and he regrets killing Lark so quickly. He wanted him to suffer more. So he vows that for Hador and Jareth, that he will not kill them, maybe never kill them. When his vengeance, when he thinks he's had enough vengeance, that's when he'll kill them. In the meantime, he'll just spend the ensuing years mercilessly tor tormenting them. Um, he's cut out the king's tongue several times and then he just lets him go. Like these these types of like little, I'm gonna make a nuisance of myself, but in a really painful way. <laughs> like that's what he's up to. So uh, in doing so and in equating uh, his vengeance with uh, essentially his love for his sister and his his not knowing what happened to her um, because he blames the frost lines for that. If they hadn't kidnapped him, he would still be with Fiori. He would know where she is. He would know if she's dead or alive, et cetera, et cetera, right? But they didn't. He, did, he didn't. He couldn't. So they took him and they took him and now he's... He has no idea what happened to her. So he has tied his vengeance against the frost lines. He's, he blames them for her, her being gone from his life. And he basically uh, torments them. He's equated his vengeance against them with his connection to Viore. So essentially he won't kill the frost lines because then once he does that, his vengeance is over and he's essentially admitting that she's lost to him forever, that she's dead or that she's whatever. Um, so that's why he continuously 
torments them throughout the years instead of just offing them the way they deserve. So he's now like a um, ruthless, full-grown king, right? And he has an oracle um, that he can't remember her name. He just calls her I. <laughs> and she, she is like, again, I got similarities to Lothair because Lothair also has an oracle. Um, shit, what was her name? Hag. He called her Hag. I forget what her real name was, but he just called her Hag. Um, but yeah, so Kesar has an oracle that's supposed to see the future. He she helps him navigate his his vengeance against the, like his feud with the Frost Lines. Um, insert cookie. Okay, so essentially, uh, I comes into the palace, the courtroom, the whatever courtroom, ballroom, throne room, throne room. That's what. It is. I comes into the throne room and basically says, "Hey, Kesar, um, Jareth Frostline is on your land, and he's just traipsing around with his new wife. And uh, you might want to go see about that because, you know, Kesar's like the the nerve, the unmitigated gall. Like how how dare he, right?" So he flitters to where Jareth is. He secretly spies on them. Jareth's wife is, her name is Lulundria, which took me a couple of, a couple dozen times to wrap my tongue around. Um, she's essentially got uh, the power to grow vines from like um, plants, basically from her fingers. Like she can control um, the earth. Like she's from the earth type. Uh, Faye, right? Um, I want to say she came from the summer court or something. Like, she's from another royal house or whatever. She's a princess, so now she's, you know, doubly princess-ish. And they appear to be genuinely in love with each other. So he's watching. Kesar spying on them. They're, like, in, like, a, a what is, like, a pool, like a waterfall type situation and they're making out and they're doing stuff and whatever right um Kesar basically jumps out and is like hey what y'all doing on my land he thinks that he's going to abduct Lulandria get her to fall in love with him to turn her against Jareth impregnate her with his child and then send her back to Jareth where according to fake custom like once that's your wife that's your wife you can't disown her no matter what so he will Jared will have no choice but to eventually put Kesar's child on his throne to rule his kingdom so that's like his like long game revenge plan against Jared right now uh so he grabs for Lulandria she freaks out she um, she makes like a, a, a doorway, a portal with her vines. And before her and Jareth can get through it, uh, Jareth attempts to kill Kesar by throwing ice daggers at him, which is like his glamera, his um, supernatural ability. Uh, he, he throws the, the, the ice daggers Kesar uses Lulandria as a shield. Grimy. Uh, she gets stabbed with the ice daggers in like her, I think like her stomach area or something. Um, and then she falls through the door, the portal, the doorway. It disappears. She's lost to him. Kesar's furious. Jareth is, you know, bereft. And Lulandria is gone. Okay, Kesar had every intention of healing Lulundra because generally the ice daggers would like slowly poison her or slowly kill her to death. Uh, but he has like a remedy back in his castle that he's gonna, he was gonna feed her and she'll be fine, right? Over time, she'll be fine. Now she's not gonna be fine. She's in the mortal realm, in plopped down in the middle of the woods somewhere, 
and she's dying. Okay, 34 minutes into the video, we're just getting up to Cookie. Okay, uh, here's where Cookie comes in. Cookie is a uh, gaming promoter. She essentially plays video games and like streams them, streams the video or the commentary or whatever from her playing uh, to advertise the game for the gaming companies or the production companies that make these games. The game, her one of her favorite, her favorite game that she's been playing is uh, essentially Gina's nod to a series that she was writing that um, the publisher decided not to continue with, which is her young adult series, um, The Force of Good and Evil. Uh, the game, essentially, that Cookie is playing is an homage to the land from those books, which I thought was really poetic and really nice. Um, so, you know, she's shit-talking and she's whatever. Cookie is, personality-wise, very feisty and very, um, very brash. But physically, she's falling apart. She has a defective heart and she needs a heart transplant. They've been unable to find her match. So she's down to the wire. It's getting, it's starting to look very grave that she's not going to get a heart and that she's going to die. She's accepted it mostly. Uh, she has a roommate named Pearl Jean, who's a crotchety old lady, who's very annoying and very, also very feisty and very uh, naggy. <laughs> and like a hypochondriac. She's always got something wrong with her. And she, uh, Cookie has adopted a, a, cat, a stray cat named Sugars. And they have like a, a tenuous relationship with each other. The cat's very stuck up and bitchy. <laughs> and, and you know, Cookie's like, but I still love you. You're, you know, as, as cat owners tend to do, like, you know, your cat, your cat may not be super cuddly. Like it happens. Um, so she's accepted her fate for the most part. Pearl Jean d is refusing to hear it. She's like, I'm not listening to this. She basically sits around the house and sweat in like yoga pants and t-shirts all day. And she just games for a little bits of time. And then, you know, the rest of the time she just lounges around the house because she doesn't have the energy to do anything. She doesn't, she's literally dying, right? So... When all hope seems to be lost and she's like accepted her fate, she gets the call that they found her a heart, a matching heart. She goes in, she gets a transplant, the heart takes. She's now back home sometime later. Um, I, I wanna say it was months maybe, months later. And weird stuff starts to happen. Like plants, plant life seems to grow around her and she starts developing abilities to like, you know, she's out in the garden one day with Pearl Jean and Sugars and she's walking her cat on a leash <laughs> and she's wearing like a, a bathrobe or something like she's, she looks hot mess and she starts to feel like this funky feeling inside and all of a sudden these vines start like coming out of the end of her fingers. And she basically recreates, a, she creates a portal with the vines and she gets sucked into the portal. Pearl Jean's, Pearl Jean and Sugars do not. They, they stay behind and they're like, oh shit, what's going on? And you know, Cookie's freaking out. Cookie lands in the middle of the, of the midnight court basically, like in the, in the middle of the, of the woods. And she's freaking out. And she's like, what just happened to me? And she, she's trying to navigate her way to um, like a village so that she can talk to someone and get some help and right. Um, she runs into Kesar because he has basically been told by I that your princess has come back to Asteria. He runs, he finds Cookie, he flitters to her, he finds her. And he realizes that she's not Lulandria, that she has elements of Lulandria, what she was before in terms of like her abilities, 
she has like the beginner's version of those abilities because she hasn't figured out how to wield them or whatever. Um, she has some of her features, like Lulandria had a gorgeous pink hair and Cookie's hair was like brown, like an auburn, like a, uh, like a sable brown color. And now she has like half brown with streaks of pink in it. So he's like, you're not my princess but he's immediately attracted to her where he's never been attracted to any woman before. He's used uh, sex as a tool to get, to further his quest for vengeance against the frost line. So he'll seduce, he seduced Jareth's first wife before Lulandria, and that was a blow to, to Jareth, but he didn't enjoy having sex with her. He hasn't really enjoyed having sex with any woman, right? So, he sees her, he's immediately attracted to her. He finds her fascinating. And he's like, okay, my plan has changed a little bit, but I'm still going to go forward with my vengeance because vengeance is number one and everything else takes a backseat to that. That remains a constant throughout the entire book. A, over the course of the book, him and Cookie form what they refer to as a team, that they're teammates for the same team. Like that's Cookie's um, language. Like that's how she, you know what I mean? Like that's how she talks, like a gamer girl. She's like, everything's about team and strategy and maps. And and that's another thing. Kesar has um, like these metal claws that he wears on top of his fingers. And when he's uh, going a little bit nutsos, he uses them to slice his own skin on like his forearms. And he draws maps in blood of like the area where Viore was last seen. And it kind of like chills him out. It like calms him down, I guess the pain. Um, no one else can read his maps, like the maps that he draws, like nobody else has been able to do in ever. He, Cookie sees the maps. He's like tattooed the maps all over his upper torso, his arms, whatever. And she sees the maps and she can read them. She finds them fascinating. She can read them because the game that she used to play, her favorite game, the layout is eerily similar to the layout of Asteria. And so uh, it kind of makes you think that at some point in one of the future books that it will be dropped that Lulundria uh, somehow managed to either pass on the information about Asteria or that someone else from Asteria came to the mortal realm and created this video game and the creators of the video game are somehow connected, right? Um, it, that doesn't get revealed in this book, but there it's there so it's like oh something to look forward to like as if you didn't have enough to look forward to but so cookie immediately also finds him attractive and throughout the book they slowly uh, fall for each other for want of a better term because again like at the end of the day whether it's paranormal romance whether it's fantasy romance it, it's still a romance novel right so that's we know that's gotta happen we want that so eventually Kesar decides okay my plan for vengeance by knocking up Lulandria or Cookie and then giving her back to Jareth has completely washed out I will never give her back to Jareth she will be mine forever and she will help me in my vengeance against the frost lines. Cookie is falling for him. She recognizes like that he's mentally and like emotionally fucked up. And she's got an a, what appears to be an infinite amount of patience when it comes to that. Every time he puts his vengeance first, she's like, okay, I'm gonna stick around for a little bit. I'm gonna see if I can win number one spot so that we can push this back the vengeance can be pushed back to number two or whatever over the course of the book 
it becomes apparent that that's never going to happen. And at some point, push comes to shove and he tells her that. I can't choose you. It will always be vengeance. And so she basically, uh, do, do should I tell you the end of the book? I don't know. Do you want me to spoil it for you? <laughs> she essentially takes the decision. She sees his connection to Hador uh, and the connection that he has made between Hador and his vengeance against Hador and his love for his sister. And she knows that as long as Hador is alive, that he will never let go of Viore. And she'll never be number one spot. She doesn't, at this point, she's given up being number one spot. But she wants to set him free because she loves him that much. And so she basically takes the decision on whether or not Hador should live out of his hands. And he flips out and banishes her back to the mortal realm with her not having a way to get back to Asteria, which she now considers her home. Because while she was with him in Asteria, he basically set her up in a castle in the, in the, in, uh, the, the Dusklands and made her honorary queen of the Dusklands. I'm bequeathing this castle to you and all of its land and everything. She used her abilities to grow um, plants and, and trees and fruit and vegetables and it's a thriving community now and it, and the people are starting to come around they, they're starting to like her and then he banishes her to back to the mortal realm she ends up in the woods she finds like a little cabin she's um depleted of strength she's injured uh, from this battle that she's just fought with Hador. She won the battle, but she's been injured. Her fey uh, immortality is making it so that she heals quickly. So she's not too worried about that, but she's landed in the middle of the woods with no resources and she has no idea where she is. She finds this little cabin. She she goes up to it, she knocks, nobody answers. The She's getting ready to essentially pass out from um, taking what's known as elder seed, which is like something that amps up her natural glamera, uh, which helped her in her fight against Hador. Uh, but once the elder seed wears off, she you're basically depleted of strength and she passes out. She makes it inside the cabin before that happens and she realizes that no one's lived there in a long time. Everything is covered in dust. So she makes it inside and then she passes out on the floor. <laughs> she wakes up however many days or weeks later um, and she gets up after she cuts bits of her hair off because it's stuck with like sticky sap to the floor. And she looks around, she starts going around the cabin exploring. She sees a framed photograph of what she who she recognizes as Lulandria and several other women who they are we don't know that's again something that might will probably get revealed in a later book um but she comes to basically comes to the conclusion that when Lulandria fell through the portal and was injured she fell through the portal and she came here to this cabin which is where she stayed until she eventually died or whatever and Cookie got her heart. Um, she takes a shower. She, you know, dresses in the, the clothes that Lilandria wore when she fell through the portal that are hanging up in the closet. They've been cleaned, they've been repaired, whatever. She dresses in those and she finds a landline phone that's still working. I don't know about that. I was like, that was one thing that was like, uh, who's paying that phone bill? <laughs> um, she calls Pearl Jean and she's like, hey, I don't know how long I've been gone. I'm sure it's been a long time. I don't know if time moves differently there. I'm back. Where? Please help me figure out where I am and come get me. So she does. So she goes back to her little farmhouse that she shares with uh, Pearl Jean. And she tells Pearl Jean everything that happened. And essentially, Cookie decides that regardless of what 
Kesar does if he comes after her. Uh, if she uh, she is waiting for her Glamera to charge back up so she can create another portal back to Asteria, and she plans on taking Pearl Jean and Sugars with her, and she's going to reclaim her kingdom in the Dusklands because fuck Kesar, he's betrayed her. He banishes her from what she considers her home, and that was like a low blow. Uh, she expected him to be angry, but he was like cruel about it, and so she can't forgive him. She does go back. She does retake the kingdom. Jareth, who towards the end of the book was kidnapped and chained to the throne <laughs> in the Dusklands, uh, it's, it's kind of come to light that Jareth may not be the supervillain that he appears. Um, the super bad stuff that they were that that his father and uncle did to Kesar during his 12 month imprisonment they kind of did to Jareth his whole life so Jareth is also kind of a victim um and now he's basically tagging along behind Kesar like uh they're like bros now Kesar's like no get get away and and Jareth's like I like I don't I don't I don't really want to go back to the to the winter court right now. Um, so they're kind of fighting side by side. So Cookie has come back and she's very regally like, this is my home. I'm going to take my fucking shit back. And if you don't like it, you can buzz off because this is my shit. Uh, Kesar has like a revelation, like an epiphany that Cookie did him a favor. He finally comes to, to the realization that Cookie did him a favor by killing Hador, that she set him free from his, the, his, the, the vengeance scheme that was slowly ruining his life. And that now he can be free and he can have a family and he can do all of these things that he never pictured doing with anybody because he, he was all about that revenge. Um, so he comes to that realization and of course he tries to go get Cookie back and explain to her what had happened and why he was like apologize. I was so mean to him, right? And she's like, no, not having it. You're just, you're just another person to me now. Like we have no connection. Uh, someone who really loved me could never be that cruel to me, right? So she's ruling her kingdom. She, Kesar is back in the midnight court. He's respecting at the moment her request for him to fuck off. And she's, you know, meeting and greeting with her people and solving little minor disputes and et cetera, et cetera, right? Being a queen, being a, a magnanimous queen. And, um, what was it? Benevolent. Being a benevolent queen. And, uh, installs Kesar. And he essentially chains himself to the throne as like a gesture, like I was held prisoner when I was a child and these bad things were done to me and you would think I would never want to be anyone's prisoner ever again, but I will be your willing prisoner because I'm in love with you and I want you. And, yeah. And so, yeah. And then, and then I lived happily ever after. Like, <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So that's that on that. Would I recommend this book to anyone? <laughs> Do you? What a stupid fucking question. Of course I would. <laughs> Am I excited for the next book in this series, whenever it may be? Yes. Like, do you see the, the neck muscles popping out when I... Yes. Uh, if, G if I can get my hands on an arc of that book, it's over for you bitches. Like, I will literally die. I want it. Give it to me now. Um, for the rating for this book, I gave it a 10. <laughs> I don't think I've ever given any book a 10. I always try and leave some wiggle room for something that literally just blows my socks off, this blew my socks off. 
I, I can't, I, I literally can't, I've raved about it so much online that it's ridiculous. I gave away when this, when this book dropped, I gave away so many copies. <laughs> I did like a giveaway for the channel. I did a giveaway on Instagram. I sent a few people who said that they were really looking forward to it and they wanted to read it, but they couldn't afford it right now. Like I, I, I just was, I was like, what's your Amazon address? What's your, what's your Amazon Kindle email address? <laughs> and I was like, you need it. I know you need it because that's, I understood. Like we were like kindred spirits. I understood the need for this book. Okay. So yeah, I've been talking for an hour, an hour, almost an hour. I think my neck just cracked. <laughs> so yeah, so I gave this book a 10 out of 10, which is the first time that's ever happened. Even Cressley's Game Maker series, I did not give. I think I gave it like a nine and a half, nine point seven five or something. This book gets a 10 because I was obsessed. And I honestly did not expect to be. I knew I would like it. I knew I would love it because it's Gina's. And she she can't, she can't, Gina can't write a bad book. Like in my opinion, it's impossible for her to write a bad book. But I also don't have a lot of um, prior history with the Fae. And like, I, I, I've talked about this in previous videos. I have read tons of um, vampire novels and tons of werewolf novels and tons of whatever. And even like Cressley's IAD series has like other things like Valkyries and nymphs and stuff. Yeah, but they're not main, like nymphs and stuff are not main characters in those. The Fae, any kind of shifter that's not just plain old werewolf shif shifter, like dragon shifters, like I don't, I don't, know. I don't have a lot of experience with those kinds of books. Um, with that like sub-genre, sub if you will. I, I, I should, and I probably will in future. But hearing that it was supposed to be like based on the Fae or like take, take place in a Fae realm, I did not expect to like it as much as I liked it. When I read the, the excerpt um, or like the little teaser, the spoiler that, that Naomi dropped online for like the blur basically I was like oh that's interesting I've never read a book where a person gets a heart transplant from someone and starts changing into a fairy princess like that sounds dope so I was excited but I didn't know I'd be this excited like <laughs> but I am <laughs> So yes, I would suggest that you go out and buy this book. If you are a person who does both e-reader and physical book or just physical book, buy the book. The mass market is literally 50 cents cheaper than the digital download. Buy the book, add it to your bookshelf. You won't regret it. I promise you won't regret it. It's an amazing book. I can't gush enough. I literally could not. I could sit here for three hours. I could not do it. Go. And that's all I have to say about this. That's it. I'm done. Um, if you like this video, if you enjoy my ridiculous personality, please consider subscribing. Insert thirsty emoji on one of these sides. I can't remember. Um, if you would like, you can follow me on social media. I do have a members only Facebook group and Instagram and a Twitter devoted to this channel. I barely use the Twitter. You're forewarned. Um, Instagram, I'm on every eight minutes. So follow me on Instagram. <laughs> Join my members only Facebook group. I do post in there as well. Um, and yeah, I don't know. That's, all, that's, that's it. I really thank you guys so much for sticking with me and watching this hour long review. <laughs> Hopefully there was equal parts book discussion and blather. Because really, what more can you ask for? Especially from me. Um, I really thank you guys so much. And I will see you guys in my next video.
Bye. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of what? I'm gonna kill you. One of these days, I'm telling you one of these days. You done? Are you done? Are you done? Okay. Anyway, my remote is dead. I'm gonna sit it over there because it's literally useless. Okay. Where the fuck was I talking? Where was I? Where was I? Where was I? At? I do. Did you guys just hear my shoulder pop? For no reason. Did you hear that? I need WD-40. Like, <laughs> anyway, um, I'm gonna stop boohooing into my spilled milk or whatever that phrase is. Uh, where where was I going with this? Anyway, why am I so? <laughs> Freckles. Um. He lived to force his enemy. He lived. He lived. Look how big my nostrils get in there. I'm like a dragon. Are you done? Are you comfortable? As soon as I start talking again, he's gonna be like, well. Okay. Um. Jareth, 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 Freckles. <sighs> oh God, oh my God, I've been talking for an hour. I've been talking for an hour and I've been sitting up straight for an hour. Like my posture has been like, that is not me. I am literally a schlump. I'm a schlub. You guys are going to be so proud of me. Look at my cup. First of all, how gorgeous is that color wise, right? It's color changing. You put something cold in it and it changes. Like if you look here, it's a pink cup, but now it's a purple cup. How fancy is that? Reusable cups that I can store my tea in. <laughs> No more styrofoam cup for Candace, unless all my cups are dirty and I don't wash them. In it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Lord. I know that's what you guys are. It's like physically impossible for him not to completely just screw me up. So satisfying. Um, my next review, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm currently reading a book that I've just started, so I'm not even sure if I like it yet, by Penelope Douglas, who's someone I've never read before in my life. It's called Birthday Girl. It's an age gap romance. So it has like, 
like older dude, younger girl. Not like skeevy younger, but like, you know, enough. Enough. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll see it on the channel. I don't know. If I like it, I'll do a review. If I don't like it, you'll never hear from hear about it again. Ever. <laughs> it's just my thing. Like, I'm sorry. I'm not going to sit here and bash an author that uh, just because I didn't care for the book. If I read a book and I don't like it, somebody else, there's probably 8 billion other people out there that do like it. And I'm not going to steer anyone away from an author by posting a bad review when they may read it and they may be obsessed. And I just wasn't. What the F happened? I don't know. What are you talking about? Anyway, um, I'm Audi 5000. I don't think people say that anymore, but. Mm -mm. What the fuck? Anyway, um, I love you so much. My remote is completely dead. No connection at all. So I'm going to have to physically press the button, which is so beneath me, to be honest. But. <laughs>